us to want to hear from you. Father, I know that there are things going on right now that people are getting blasted on every side. Father, I pray right now for the homes of our church. Father, the enemy right now wants to see it destroyed. And Father, I know this with the fact that if the enemy gets into the house, Father, it will get into here. Father, I pray for the men of God here. Father, I pray for just boldness. I pray that, Father, we protect our homes, protect our wives, that we put on the whole armor of God. That, Father, that we will withstand everything that the enemy wants to throw at us. But, Father, help us to realize that we can't do it all by ourselves. But we have to have your help. We have to have your Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you just break the men of the house's hearts right now, God, that we humble ourselves. That, Father, we can say as Joshua did for me and my house, so we're going to serve you. That, Father, what a generational blessing that was and what a generational demand and, and just a statement that was that not for his generation but future generations. And Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that we just make those stands, make those decrees. But Father, I'm reminded when the children of Israel, every battle they had and everything that they faced, that they built a landmark. Father, help us today to build a landmark that we look back at every battle that we've been through, that we see that you were there, that you helped us through it and you carried us through it. I'm reminded of the footprints in the sand. There were times that I couldn't even walk, and I look back, and it was you carrying me, Father. I just pray right now that you renew your people's strength, that you just breathe the breath of life in them. As Ezekiel said when he looked over the valley of the dry bones, he said, can these bones live again? Father, I pray right now that you just breathe the breath of God into us today. Father, send down your fire. And Father, I will give you praise for everything you're doing right now. Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, Father, let today be the day that they make the decision to follow you. As Pastor said last week, Father, pick up the cross. Father, there's sometimes it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to live right. But Father, we realize that we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And Father, I just pray right now that we just depend upon those promises that you promised in your word that we grab a hold of them. And Father, that we lean not on our understanding, but Father, we lean totally into you. Father, I praise you for everything you're doing. For in Christ, I pray these things. Jesus, I love you this morning. I thank you so much for a, for a house that we can come to and, and lift you up, God. That around the world, the places that, that we may have seen pictures of, the places that we may have been where there are no lights, there, there is no air conditioning, there's no cushioned seats. And Father, they, they are so happy to be there. They travel for miles and miles by foot and carpooling, whatever it may be, God. And they love to be in the house of the Lord. And God, this morning, just as David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I, I get excited, God. Every, every Sunday morning, I wake up. I'm excited because I get the chance to be with other believers. I get the chance to, to worship you with, with other believers and learn more about you, God. I thank you for that opportunity today. I'm just excited to be here. Just as we get excited for, for things to start and, and, and athletics and, and school and whatever else it may be, God, help us to get excited about the chance that we have to come into the sanctuary and be with other believers and, and grow in your word and lift you up through music and singing and 
and giving to you, God, because we love you so much. Thank you for what you're doing through this church. Thank you for what you're doing in this county. This past Wednesday, God, as almost 300 teenagers gathered together, God, to lift up your name and to come closer to you. Thank you so much that things are happening in this county. God, as some of the kids told me, I didn't even realize that there was that many, that many kids that were, that were on fire in this county. God, and there are more. There are more. Start it in our families here, Father. Help us to realize our faith is so much bigger than just us. Because a Christian faith is not just a personal thing. It's a thing that we share. It's a thing that grows. And I thank you for the opportunity to learn more about it today. That as we come into this house, I pray in the name of Jesus that there would be freedom. That it wouldn't just be a repetition. It wouldn't just be something that we feel like is forced. It's a choice. How we worship is a choice, God. And if we love you, and if we want you, and we need you, Father, lead us today. Lead our hearts. Lead Doug and the praise team as they lift you up, and they encourage us, and they join with us, and they give us the opportunity to come into your throne room today, Father. Thank you so much for all the effort that is being put into this service today, God. It's about you, Father. We want you. We need you. We come in saying, Jesus, show up in this house. Let your glory be shown. We don't just want to know more about you. We want to know you more today, Jesus. Speak to us through your word today, Father. We're never the same again. Christianity would not just be something that we do sitting in a chair twice a week, maybe even once a week. But Father, as we add it up, it would be our everything. Not just one day or two days, every day that, that we would grow inside of it from these services. This would be a, a place where we would start from every week, Father. That your spirit would lift us up from these services that we would leave this place starting today fresh and new. That if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Everything, all the old stuff is passed away. Just as I was in the park this week, God, with the guys and the water was flowing, I was saying it's consistently moving. It doesn't stand still. Help our faith to continue to move and to grow. Thank you so much, Jesus. We love you this morning. Hey, Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for this opportunity this morning to come into this house and God worship you. God, I thank you that we're able to celebrate who you are this morning, God. We're able to celebrate who you've been in us this week. God, whether it's been one of those weeks to celebrate or or it's been one of those weeks where we're just still fighting, God, we get a chance to celebrate that we're still here and that we're still standing. God, I thank you for that. God, allow us to just enjoy your presence this morning to enjoy who you are and what you've done God to allow your spirit to truly lead us and guide us and direct us this morning God I thank you for that God I just thank you for that opportunity to come into this house God to come into this place of worship and join with this body of believers and lift up your name and God I believe that as we do that your presence will be here God, your presence will be in our midst. God, you will, you will bring that salvation, God, presence this morning. You'll bring that healing presence this morning. God, you'll bring that presence that breaks addictions, and you'll bring that presence, God, that, that mends broken hearts and broken lives and puts them back together. God, I thank you for that. God, I thank you that when you show up, all of those things happen. God, I praise you for that. God, I thank you that we just get to be a part God, of that kind of service this morning. God, that, Lord, we know there'll be people here that need to hear your word. And, God, that will respond in salvation today. God, and we thank you for that. God, we know there are people here that are broken. God, that are real. 
and they come in with real problems. And God, you don't you don't shy away from those, God, and you're not afraid of those. You're not afraid of real people with real problems, God, and I thank you for that. But God, you embrace them and you love them, God, and you help them. And God, I thank you for that. God, I thank you that we serve a God that you don't have to come in here fixed to get your attention. But God, at the point that we call on your name, you are there and we have your attention, God, and I thank you for that. God, I praise you for that. I thank you that, Lord, I don't have to get it all right first. And I don't have to come in knowing the tradition. And I don't have to come in knowing the ritual to to be able to maybe get into your presence. But God, I just have to call on your name and you show up. And I thank you for that. I thank you, God, that once we have that presence in our lives and we've asked for salvation, that God, you are there. God, you've given us the right to be called a child, a joint heir with Christ. And God, I thank you for that. God, help us to stand boldly before you this morning. God, in awe of who you are and what you've done. But God, not having to have fear of anything that's going on in our lives because you already know it. But God, being able to boldly stand in your presence and just worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. God, I don't have to worship you trying to hide some kind of thing that maybe you don't know about. But God, I can just worship you knowing that you know it all. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you that I can worship you in that kind of spirit this morning. And God, when we do that, you respond. And God, I know that your presence shows up. God, I thank you for how awesome that is. I thank you that it's your righteousness that covers me this morning. That God, if I was standing on my own righteousness, God, I wouldn't even come close. But I can stand in your righteousness this morning. The righteousness that happens by the blood covering my soul. God, I thank you for that. God, I thank you that you're there, that you're present in our lives, that you're there to to lift us up. God, that we get a chance this morning to worship the only one that can save a heart, the only one that can change and transform a life. God, I thank you that we get that kind of opportunity this morning. God, to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to worship the, the, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. God, I thank you that we get a chance this morning to worship the God that has always been and the God that will forever be. God, I thank you that at your name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And God, I thank you that we get to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. If you agree with me, stand all over this place let us get ready to worship the king of kings and the lord of lords the only one that saves the only one that heals and the only one that delivers in jesus name how many people came ready to worship this morning give him a shout of praise
to those places, Father. We just worship you, Father. Speak your worship to him this morning. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, with feet me. And there I find you in the mist, in oceans deep, my faith will stand, and I will call upon your name, and keep my eyes above the when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you Presence 
Just rest in his presence this morning. We just worship you, Father. We worship you, Father. We praise you in this place, Father. But there is none like you today, Father. But there is none like you, Father. God. We praise you, Father. We worship you in this place, Father. is higher, your name is greater, all my hope is in you, your word is unfailing and your promise is unshaken, all my hope is in you, your
no matter what the situation, God, we can always go to your word and find a promise that's not shaken by the situation. And we just praise you and worship you in this place, God. I have the awesome, awesome task of receiving the offering this morning, but after that, I just might preach. Sorry. <laughs> you can be seated. First of all, I want to start out by telling you all that we had a girls' camp. We nothing. I helped cook, but that's all I did. But we had girls' camp this weekend, and there were some awesome, awesome ladies that worked in that, and I just want to thank them for what they did. And you're going to see some of the pictures on the screen right now. I'd like to read from Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. It said, As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Guys, you can go ahead and be receiving the offering. I want to talk to you for just a minute about offerings and tithes in a different light. Maybe you haven't seen it this way before. But an offering is something that's offered in worship or devotion. That is according to Webster's Dictionary. And then... You know, Christian giving, our offering is about more than the gift. It's more than that gift. A lot of our talk in the Christian community about tithe and offering talks about stewardship and also about rewards. But I want to just put in your mind today, what about devotion and relationship? The reason that this lady gave, I do believe, what she actually didn't have to give, if you looked at it in our light, was because, I think, with her relationship with God, she trusted Him. And because of that trust, she was able to give all that she had. And so I want you to think of your giving today as your relationship with God. How am I giving in relationship? I've been married to my husband for lots of years. <laughs> you thought I was going to tell you, didn't you? But I was afraid I might get it wrong. <laughs> no, but you know what? I love him dearly. And I trust him with all that I have because I have a relationship. And that's what giving, I think, today I want to get in your mind about giving is relationship. If you'll stand, we'll ask the Lord to bless these offerings. Father, we come to you today thanking you for all that you are. And Lord, I just thank you for the Spirit of God that showed up in this place. And I just ask that you continue here. And I pray for these offerings. God, I know that you took the fish and the loaves and you multiplied them. And we need this multiplied in the day that we live to be able to do more and more and more for your kingdom. And I just ask that you'll bless the people who gave in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I say something crazy? I love crazy. All my life has been a series of Sunday school rooms. And then suddenly I found these life rooms. I was thinking the same thing. Cause like, I've been searching my whole life to find my own place. And maybe it's the worship or the brand new stage. But with life groups, with life groups I, found my place. I found my place. It's nothing like I've ever known before. Life's just so much more. Life is just so much more. Life is just so much more. With you, with you. Life is just so much more.
think it's funny. We laugh so hard at Lyle. That's me. That's what I was going to say. Never met a church with people just, just like, like me. me. Jinx. Jinx. Jinx again. I love your congregation and all of this expansion. These life groups were just meant to be. Say goodbye. Say goodbye to your glory days. You don't have to sit around anymore. Life is so much more. Can I say something crazy? Would you join my life crew? Can I say something crazier? Yes! Hey church family, I hope everyone had a wonderful week. Here's what's going on. All right, Secret Sisters, all the kids are back in school and you have an August challenge. Do something this month for your Secret Sister having to do with the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Or you can do a small gift that starts with the letter R. If you want any information about Secret Sisters or need help with ideas, talk to Cindy Walls. Are you a high school senior through the age of 25? Our AMPT 412 college ministry is just for you. They meet every Monday night at 6.30 at Parker and Jennifer Householder's house. For any more information, talk to Kelsey Bryant. Her number is 363-5461. All right, it's football time in Tennessee, and this Thursday, a bunch of us are going to meet at Buffalo Wild Wings in Alcoa to watch the Texas A&M versus South Carolina game. If you want to be a part, come on out. It starts at 6 o'clock, so be there by then. Don't forget to sign in today. You can use the QR code in your bulletin and sign in right from your smartphone, or you can use the sign-in sheet in your bulletin and give it to any greeter. Thanks. That's what's going on. Have a blessed week, everyone. Video team, a big hand for that. I have the awesome privilege of introducing our special speaker this morning, which I have only met within the last 30 seconds. However, um, Pastor Ronnie and Pastor Brad think very highly of this speaker when that's all I need to know because I think very highly of them. Um, from another country, Ronnie and Brad sent me something I'm supposed to read about you. Yeah, you might want to say uh-oh. Um, Pastor Lambert has been a friend of Pastor Ronnie's for many years. They've done many mission trips together in Peru, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Uh, Pastor Lambert helps us get Bibles for prison ministries around the world. He's also the person that connected us after Hurricane Katrina so that we could help do some relief work down there. Uh, he's been a missionary in several countries. He's been a pastor, and he currently works for the American Bible Society. And Brad said he is one of the best speakers that he has ever heard. So I'm not setting you up for failure or nothing, but you better be good. Okay, give him a hand as he comes up to bring the word this morning. I'm in trouble. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I'm in trouble. I am so excited to be here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about me. I met Ronnie at, um, at a camp one time at a, at a minister's retreat. And uh, he thought I was a lonely, poor pastor that didn't know anybody. And like Ronnie, he always takes in the stray dog. And he took me in as a friend. What he didn't realize was that he said, you've cost me more money than anybody I've ever taken. Ronnie said I was going to be a millionaire till I met you. Uh, I got him involved in some missions projects. And we started traveling together, as he said. And then Ronnie's one of these He's a man's man is what I call him. He's a guy that uh, just feels passionate about starting churches. Rio, like this church, is a, uh, uh, he could have said, you know what, I'm just going to do my thing. Everybody's going to do what I do. But he sent people out and started churches all over the Marysville area and around the world. 
and God has blessed the Rio uh, churches in a marvelous way, and so God uses them greatly. My ministry has always been a missionary. I, I've pastored, I've actually pastored more overseas than in the U.S., although I've pastored in the U.S., and so I'm here today to share. Now, they're on a mission trip, and I am excited about what they're doing. I also leave tomorrow to go to Ecuador, and so I'm excited about what God is doing there. So it's, it's a wonderful part to be about with a group of people that are passionate about sharing God's Word around the world. Aren't you glad to be a part of that? Let, let's pray this morning before we get started. I want you to pray about two things. One, I want you to pray that God anoints me so I can live up to the, uh, Pastor Brad's reputation, hopefully. Number two, I want you to pray that not only the Lord anoints well, really, the Lord anoints me, number one, to minister to you, but number two, let's pray for them as they minister in uh, the uh, kingdom and God uses them in a great way in ministry, okay? Would you pray with me? Father, right now, Lord, we just pray that you anoint this service, Lord. You anoint me to share your word, and God, you anoint uh, uh, me with a passion, Lord, to speak life into this congregation. And then, Lord, that uh, you just anoint Pastor Brad and Pastor Ronnie as they minister. We lift them up in prayer, God. We bless you for what you're going to do, and we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, now, let me just share with you, I believe God sent me here to speak life into you. I believe that the Word of God brings life and not death. I believe that the Word of God brings light instead of darkness. I believe it brings joy instead of sadness. So I'm here to share the Word of the Lord today. Before I get started, I don't know who did all of this, but this is nice, I'm telling you. I, I, I was looking at this and I was saying, Man, I need somebody around. I live in Georgia now. I need somebody to come to Georgia. And I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Uh, boy, this is pretty. So take your Bibles, if you will, with me. Now, I, I'm a different kind of guy. I see things differently. I don't mean to. I just do. And so I want you to turn in the book of Luke, chapter 1, and I want to read from you a Christmas story. I want to preach to you today about participating in the miracle of Christmas every day of your life. Now, it's August. It's hot out there, and I know what you're thinking, but I want to share God's Word with you just a moment. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, verse 26, was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the household of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the, come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled by his, at his saying and considered what manner of greeting that was. Now I want you to see that. What he said was very earth-shaking to her. Notice what he said when he spoke to her. Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. That's a Middle Eastern blessing. Verse 20, verse 32, or verse 31, I'm sorry. Then, or, well, let's go back to verse 30. <laughs> then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive to your, in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be call, call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the household of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, that's another one. Now, she's just been troubled by a greeting. And in Jewish religion, there was not, they were one God, 
And now they're saying this one will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. Now, he, she's just been told a unusual greeting by an angel. Then the angel says, that baby that you're going to be born, his name will be Jesus, uh, and then he will be the Son of God. And by the way, your old aunt is pregnant and going to have a child. That's a good day's journey right here. And this is now the si her sixth month who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May God add his blessings on his word. This is a Christmas story. We always take it at Christmas time and we talk about this story. However, it's much more than a Christmas story. It's a powerful encounter in the life of someone that was able to change the world. It's not just a seasonal story. It's not about the 12 days of Christmas. I don't know why we do this, but we take these stories and we put them on the Christmas shelf and we pull them down and we read them almost like we tell the story of St. Nick or Santa Claus as though it, you know, it only happens at Christmas time. It probably was not even in winter when this took place. It's a story about a young girl who has an powerful encounter with God and it changes her life. One of the chapters of this historical event is when God appears to Mary because it's as though God is preparing to do something awesome and great in the world. He's about to release his son into the universe. He's about to change the Old Testament ruling of the law to the fulfillment of prophecy from Genesis all the way to Malachi. It's as though God is saying the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament is about to take place today. And I want to tell you that God is about to break your silence. God wants to speak into your life and to change you as never before. Now look with me just a moment. This Gabriel, God's top general in his angelic army, is called to go to a teenage girl who has just been engaged to a young carpenter who was probably in his 20s, early 20s, her in her mid to late teens, and they, she receives a word from God. So the first thing about this is God speaks to her and gives her a word. You remember the word. It said, rejoice, Mary, because uh, you're blessed among women. Now, what that saying means is it is to a woman who's pregnant. You ever notice a, a, a pregnant woman and you don't know what to say and you say to her, my, you're glowing today, you know? I mean, you just kind of, hey, you're pregnant. I don't know what else to say, so you're glowing, <laughs> And that's the greeting that they gave to her. You're, you're blessed. You're blessed because you're pregnant. You're going to have a baby. Now, the problem with that was she wasn't married. She had not consummated her relationship with her betrothed. She hasn't been in relationship. She knew there was something wrong. A strange man walks into her home. He delivers a saying that is totally wrong to her culture, to her circumstance, and says, I've got a word from God. You're you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Jesus, uh, and he's the son of God. And let me tell you something else. You remember your old Aunt Elizabeth who never could have a child? She's six months pregnant. A word from God. I want to give you a word from God today. 
God has a word for you. One word from God can change your life. Let me, let me give you an example of how powerful the word of God is. Many of us remember a guy named Abram. Abram means the father. He's a father who never had children. And yet this man one day has an encounter with God. He's an idol maker. He probably spent his time fixing up idols for any way you wanted to worship. But out of the blue, he hears a word from God. Uh, and the word of the Lord was simple. You need to leave this land. You need to forsake those around you. You need to trust me. And the Bible said that Abram believed God uh, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Uh, one word, if you accept it from God, uh, will change your life in such an awesome way that just like Mary, who's a teenager, who doesn't understand understand it all, who gets given a whole lot of information, but it changes uh, her life. God wants to change your life. Let me give you a good illustration. A funeral takes place. Word is brought to Jesus that the friend that they had loved, uh, the brother of Martha and Mary has died. Uh, but instead of running and hearing about it, or even before he dies, uh, Jesus goes about his business. Four days later, after his death, he appears. Uh, and Mary or Martha says, you know what? He's starting to smell. Uh, he doesn't look very good. Uh, but God has a word in into the life of Lazarus, even though he stunk, even though he was corrupt to the world, when there was no hope for the world, God speaks and he says one simple phrase, into the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man who was rotten in his flesh came back to life and began to live. I don't know your circumstance. I don't know where you are today. I don't know if you're like uh, this young girl who sits there waiting for her future, wondering what it's going to be. Oh, she's got a plan. She's got it all together. She knows what she's going to do. But all of a sudden, God says, I got a greater plan. I, I've got a bigger thing than you can ever imagine. It's going to be more awesome than you could ever believe. And by the way, you look like you're pregnant. Uh, it looks like you're going to have a baby. This baby is going to be different than any other baby you've ever seen. He will be called Jesus. He will be the Son of God. Or maybe you're like Abraham trying to etch out a living and you've come to church hoping you're going to make it and all of a sudden God says, if you'll trust me, you'll walk with me. I will bless you and you can believe that word from God and it will be counted righteousness unto you. Or maybe you're like Lazarus. Uh, your life has passed. Uh, you begin to rot and it looks like your world. There is no hope. But God speaks and he says to you, I've got a word for you. Come forth. Uh, don't be dying. Don't smell. I've got news for you. You're going to live again. There is a word from God for you today. And if you will listen, if you will quieten your spirit and you will reach out to him, he will speak into your life. Life. When God speaks, it may not be the word that makes sense. I know Mary was kind of troubled by it. It didn't make sense what he said. I remember a few years ago, I was called by my doctor. I had found a little bump on the back of my shoulder, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor said it wasn't nothing. I went to another to get a second opinion, and the other doctor said, well, I've got news for you. I think we need to look at it. It was a little cyst in my back. Uh, they took the cyst out in the doctor's room. He sent it off for tests. Uh, I flew to California for some meetings. Uh, I was in California. I arrived the night before at 7 in the morning. The doctor calls. He said, Charles, I don't want to upset you, but you have a, in the middle of the cyst, there was something rare there, so unusual, we really don't know what it is exactly. And he said, you need to come back into the office. Uh, and he said to me, how long are you going to be in California? And I said, well, I'm supposed to be here a week. He said, I'll take your time, come back later. I don't know about you, but when you get a phone call and they tell you that you have something weird, you're not going to just relax and go to the beach. Uh, you're going to go back to the doctor 
doctor. That afternoon, I got on a plane. I flew back home. The next morning, I was in the doctor's office. He said, we're going to have to do surgery. I said, let's do it now. He said, we're not prepared for it. I said, okay, do it this afternoon. He said, it's too early. We'll do it tomorrow morning. I've got to get a room at the surgical center or at the hospital. And he, I said, well, do it tomorrow afternoon. He said, you're a little pushy. I said, it's about my life. So I went home. I got ready. They took the surgery. They said, if it is what we think it is, if it's spread, we may have to do a lot. I began to pray the scriptures. I began to ask God for a word, and I turned to Psalms 117, verse 18, and it says this, you shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. And when I heard that word from God, I knew everything was going to be okay. All I'm telling you today is it may be very confusing this moment, but I want to tell you that God is wanting to reach out to you just like he did a young girl named Mary and change your life. He has a word for you. The second thing that is interesting, this word was prophetic. Look at verse 30 through 32 or 33. Do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. This, you, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, and he'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God he will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's uh, descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Immediately, God prophesies how this word will take place. The prophecy gives purpose to the word that God just gave her. Do you hear this? When God gives you a word, he also gives you a prophecy. In other words, he gives you the purpose of the word, the prophetic word. You were born with purpose. God wants to declare his word into your life with purpose. And God wants you to fulfill his purpose that he created you for. Prophecy is not about declaring your future. I know what somebody wants. You want to hear, you're going to be a millionaire. You're going to win the lottery. Buy a ticket if you're going to win the lottery. There's the thought. Everybody always tells me, says, Charles, if I win the lottery, buy a ticket. It's the first step to winning the lottery. Prophecy is not about declaring your future. It's about declaring your purpose. Many people live their lives to be fulfilled, and it's because they've not found their purpose. It's amazing with me. When you travel with Pastor Ronnie, I, I, I'm a little different. I do a lot of traveling. He, I travel constantly. I do about 100,000 miles to 150,000 miles a year in a plane. I sleep in hundreds of hotels. I did not sleep last night because I stayed with a friend nearby. And so I'm always up and down and everything. He is, and I like to have my own room because I get up in the middle of the night. I don't sleep. I want to read. He, and I don't like people that snore. That's just a thought. I, I just don't like all of that. But Ronnie loves to travel in the cheapest hotel around, and he wants to share a room with you. <laughs> There's a reason he's like that. He's not fulfilled by what he has in his hand. He's fulfilled by his purpose. His purpose is sharing the gospel. He can do it on the cheap. He can do it on the sly. He can do it any way you want to do it, but he's going to do it. See, some of you are trying to find your purpose. You're trying to make it in life. You may think, well, if I had the boat, if I had the home, if I had the camp, if I had this or that, and you're looking for that word that gives you fulfillment. The prophetic word gives you purpose. Purpose of who you are. If you don't know your purpose, you'll never be settled. You'll never be content. You'll never be happy. I travel to Africa quite a bit. Africa is a fun place to go to. The first time you go to Africa, you go, I'm going to Africa. It's exciting. I go to a place called Dungu. Dungu is a place where 
Joseph Carney, the Lord's Resistance Army has killed thousands of people. I work among the widows and orphans, rape victims, widows that have lost their homes, their husbands, their children, children that have lost their moms and dads. And I travel quite a bit. Now, what I've learned about Africa is you pretty much, it's not like going to Latin America or India. You know, you go to Latin America, you can eat different kinds of foods. You go to India, you get all these wonderful foods. In Africa, it's just pretty much chicken, hamburgers, and french fries. I mean, that's it. You just kind of stick with the basics. My favorite place to eat is in Dungu. Dungu, I eat in a garage or underneath a tree. I've learned that to wash your hands, the way they wash hands is they get a bucket of water and a bar of soap and you just wash your hands and then you have one towel and you have 40 people that are going to eat. So I've learned to be the first one in line to dry my hands. There's a reason. After we do that, we sit down and they bring out rice and beans. Now, I'm a Cajun. I'm from Louisiana. I grew up eating rice and beans. Do you know what a Cajun is? Cajun is the French that settled in Louisiana. My definition of a Cajun is someone who goes fishing and doesn't catch any fish and goes home and eats the bait. That's my <laughs> definition of a Cajun. But we grew up eating rice and beans. Rice and beans. So I eat that rice and beans. What makes it so good is that I am doing my purpose. I am in the middle of a group of widow women, violated, destroyed, with orphans running around. I am there eating the best meal. It's my favorite meal. It's the most important day of my journey. I took some Americans with me one time from Nashville, and they said, that wasn't a very good meal. I said, it's the best meal in Africa. Because you see, I find my purpose sitting with those women and those children. God has a word for you. And he has a prophetic word that gives you purpose. The third thing that's interesting about this story is the word of promise and prophecy also can be perplexing. Look at Mary. She looks at the angel and she says, ask the question, how will this be since I'm a virgin? We got a problem. <laughs> In this moment, I've never known a man. How am I going to have a child? In her mind, at that moment, this young teenager, this teenage girl could, not, could only understand it in the way she lived and in her environment. You see, there are a lot of things you're not going to understand when God speaks to you. When God called me to be a missionary, I was nine years old. The fathers I'd been away from home was at a kid's camp. I had moved, went there, and God spoke to me to be a missionary. And I knew that was what I was going to do my whole life. I had no idea. My dad was an alcoholic who later left my mother, who I was raised by a single parent. I had no money, no education, no way of becoming educated. But God said, I've got a plan. And I would probably, like Mary, say, how in the world, God, are you going to do it in my circumstance? It meant for her she could be a social outcast. It meant that her husband, her future husband, could put her away. And worst of all, they could pick up stones and stone her. Any word from God is perplexing in the human perspective. You never will be able to under, fully understand it. If you try to understand it, you will do it from your human perspective and not from God's promise. In other words, you'll try to make it happen the way you think it should happen. But you've got to remember, God never sees us as we are, but how he made us and formed us before the very foundations 
of the world. Because God calls those things that are not as though they were. Let me give you an example. Gideon is a coward. Gideon is hiding. But what is God calling? You man of valor. You man of valor. When God looks at you, he doesn't say, Joe, you fouled up so many times, I love you anyway. He looks at you and says, Joe, you are who I called you, no matter what has happened to you. He calls those things that are not as though they were. A problem of perplexity. How do I make it happen? There are things that God speaks into your life that you can't make happen. But God will do it. Then the last thing. Because of a word from God, even though she was perplexed, Mary took a step of faith. She moved on. She said, I, in verse 38, am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Now, let me explain to you what she just said when she said that. She said, in other words, I'm going to take a step of faith. You are an angel. You've said I'm going to be pregnant. You said all of these things. I know that when I walk out this door, if it doesn't happen like God says, I'm a dead person. I am going to be an outcast. I am going to be rejected by my future husband. But I'm going to let you work out the details. I'm going to trust God. Had she not done this, we would not know anything about her. It isn't that we just pulled off the shelf a Christmas story. We just heard an encounter with God. Do you understand that God doesn't want to give you some Christmas story? He wants to give you an encounter with the power of his presence. Mary just believed in. Had she not done what she'd done, we wouldn't know it. You see, you got to learn to trust God and let God work out the details. Walking by faith is just believing that God is going to solve it all. He's going to make it happen. Over the years, I've learned one thing that God wants to work in my circumstance. A few years ago, many years ago, to be honest with you, I used to say a few years ago, now it's about 15 years ago. I went to a church service. I was pastoring a church in California. My young people wanted to go hear this weird preacher. And I went with them, not because I believed this preacher, but because he was weird. And I wanted to protect my family. He had long hair, he played the piano, he prophesied. The place was packed. I went in blue jeans, my cowboy boots, sat on the front row in the far side. I really wanted to sit in the back, but they insisted, the pastor insisted, I either sit on the platform and I chose the front row. He preached that, morning, morning, that evening. The place was packed. I was just wanting to make sure I could answer all the questions when he, the kids came home. And so I was writing notes. In the middle of his message, he stops, and he points over at my side and says, Sir, stand up. I turned to see who the sir was. And he said, You, you on the front row with the cowboy boots. I looked down, looked over to see anybody else had cowboy boots. In the blue jeans, stand up. I stood up. He said, I want to tell you what God just showed me, and he began to prophesy. He said, you're going to travel the world. You're going to do this. And God's going to open doors that you never dreamed possible. And he began to explain some of those doors. And he said, God, then he began to tell something else. And I want to keep that secret for me. When he got through, I sat down. My wife said, aren't you excited? I said, not really. 
I didn't ask for that. Now, I, everybody's going to hold me accountable to it as though I'm the one responsible for it. I really kind of, just be honest, it ticks me off. <laughs> we go home. My wife says, you should be excited. I said, why? In two years, if this doesn't happen, you're going to blame me. You didn't believe. That's the next thing. If we ever get that, you, here's the word, you didn't believe. It would have happened if you'd have believed. I didn't ask for it to happen. So I sat down. A few months later, God began to move. Little by little, God began to do it. I was amazed. But half the prophecy, that that I didn't want to tell you, didn't come true. And I began to think, okay, 50-50 shot. He got a little excited at the end. You know how us charismatics are. We get all excited. Us charismatics, you know how we are. A few years later, about four years ago, I'm in Kenya, Nairobi. I was on a trip to Congo, and I met the pilot, and the pilot was a Christian. We used uh, missionary aviation when we go into Congo, and he and I got to be friends, and we, we would laugh together. And so I had two days left over in Nairobi till my plane to leave. And so I, I, I went to the hotel. He dropped me. I got to the hotel. And he gave me his phone number. And he said, look, uh, when you're in Nairobi, if you're free, give me a call. I was going to preach that morning. I actually was going to preach in a, a church there that maybe perhaps you know. But anyway, I was preaching in that church. And I woke up the night before, and I was sick. I'd had a cold for a couple of days, and I just really felt achy all over. And I called the pastor, and I said, look, thank you for the invitation, but I think I'm going to stay in the room and try to rest before I get on the plane. And so the next morning, I wake up on Sunday morning, and I feel pretty good. But I'm still achy and pain. I think, well, I need to go to church. It's Sunday. I need to go. So I called the pilot. He says, I'll come pick you up. He picks me up. We go to his church, and they have a guest speaker. He's a man that I really didn't know anything about. He preached a sermon on healing. I thought, well, I need to be healed. I've got a bad cold. Why can't God just heal a cold? So I wait till everybody goes down. They call everybody down. It's a church of about a 1,000. They fill up the altars. And I'm the last one. I go to this side because the evangelist is on that side. So I go over on this side just to pray, God, heal me. When I'm praying there, they said that the ushers, I mean, the Elders of the church were going to come and pray for me. So I waited for him to come, or the elders to come, and I felt somebody put their hand on me. And then they began to prophesy. The strange thing was that the prophecy was the same prophecy that was given to me 15 years earlier. And then he came to the end of it. And he said the very same thing that I've kept to myself. And he said, I know you didn't think it was going to happen, but you've trusted me. Keep trusting. You're going to see it. Now, still had my cold, just to let you know that. <laughs> but God was faithful. You see, when you receive a word from God, you're going to have to take a step of faith. Some of you here today, you've been in a dry season. You've been wondering, how are you going to make it? What's the key to your victory? How are you going to overcome it? And like a little girl, God is saying, I have a word for you. It's going to mess up your life. It may be so strange, it'll be so different that you can't even explain it to your family. It will be for your purpose because you see, you were designed by God for a purpose. It'll be perplexing. You're not going to understand it all. It's not going to be step one, step two, step three. It's going to be God saying, trust me and I will figure it out. You may think you're going to be stoned, but I've got good news for you. The rocks don't hurt that much after the fifth one. 
Or it may be saying, God saying, just trust me. Just trust me. And then take a step of faith. Let's pray. Father, I've shared a simple word today. Lord, you've called us to be simple in our message, but so deep in your presence. I pray that this message touches the life of people today. I pray that, God, there's a person here, whether it's a teenage girl or a young man or a mother or a father or a, 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 an older adult, Lord, doesn't matter who's come to church wondering, and God, you're speaking to their heart right now, and you're talking to them, and you're letting them know they are important, and there's something great about to happen in their life. They don't understand, God. They're crying out for direction, and you keep saying the same thing. Trust me. Trust me. God, speak to them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now look at me just a moment. Would you stand? I'm a strong believer that God has purpose in all of our lives. I'm a strong believer that you don't have to force it. Just trust Him. He's going to make it happen. There are some of you who are like me. Just a young kid raised by a single mom. And God said, I want to use you. The first time I went to be a missionary, I went to our denomination's headquarters and I asked them if I could be a missionary and they said, well, you don't have any education. True. Do you speak another language? Barely can speak English. Not well. If you're Cajun, folks, we don't speak English very well. No. You got any supporters? No. I'm sorry. You can't be a missionary. What do you do? What most of you don't know is that there was a man in my church that I pastored who won a lawsuit because a drunk had hit his car in the company he was in. He had gotten hurt. He was not a believer, but he said when God spoke to him and said, when you win this, you're going to have to bless this man of God. He walked up and handed me a year's salary to be a missionary and said, here it is. There was a widow woman in our church that was left a pickup truck. And her kid said, you don't need that pickup truck. You need a big car. I had a big car that was as old as Methuselah. And she traded me a brand new pickup for that old car. I could tell you of another story that followed, but the one that really touches me is when a man called me one day and he said, Sir, I want you to know who I am. I'm the head of a missions agency. And he said, You don't know me. But my aunt, and he named her name, she was my Sunday school teacher when I was a little boy. She was in a nursing home. And she called him twice a week and said, I have a little boy that was in my Sunday school who's a grown man now that's going to be a missionary, and you've got to help him. And that man called me and said, if you will go to college, I will give you a full scholarship. You just got to do one thing. You got to make good grades. I graduated. Went on to get my master's doctorate. Never owned a owed a dime. Could not done it without a word from God. He's here in this room. And if you'll just stop, if you'll speak. Here's what I want you to do. 
If you feel like God has spoken to you today and you're ready to follow him, I want you to come to this altar. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, don't wait. If you don't come, I'm going to sit down and turn it over to Doug. But if you come, I'll pray with you, and I'll believe God with you, and your world will change. Your world will change. One, two, three. Just start coming. That's it. Just come. Father, you know who they are. Now here's what I want you to do. There's a couple of men here. God is speaking to you very deeply. You're a businessman and God is saying, I told you to trust me. Come. Just obey him. Just obey him. I want those of you that will join with me with these. And let's pray for them. Would you do that? Would you come? Would you join with me for these? And let's pray for them in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for this little lady. God, let your glory be done in her life. In the name of Jesus, by your power, God, touch her. God, let your glory, God, give her the answer she needs. Hallelujah. God, pray for this young man and this lady. Let your will be done in their lives. Lord, we surrender. We trust you. We know you're going to do it in Jesus' name. Lord, we know you're going to do it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, just thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for your word that, that changes lives, God. Lord, we thank you for the man of God that brought that word this morning. We just worship you and praise you, Father God. If the ushers would get ready at the back door, we're going to receive an offering for uh, Brother Lambert. If you feel like uh, you'd like to give him something to bless him for his time here, they're just going to be standing back there for you to put that in there. We'll make sure he gets that before he leaves today. How many people appreciate a man of God that has an on-time word from God? We thank you so much for being with us today.
you're dismissed this morning, be respectful of those that are still praying in the altars. And have a great week. And remember, Pastor Brad and Ronnie, they'll be leaving sometime within the next 24 hours to leave Panama, going into Columbia to finish their trip out for the rest of the week. Have a great week. i